This session is for those of you who already know what the Security Champions program is, at least understand the concept, and are planning to build it at your organization in the near future. So how many of you saw or attended the keynote yesterday? OK, how many of you know? Keep your hands off for a second. How many of you already know what the Security Guardians program is? Oh, I really thought I was going to trick you, because Chris mentioned it. I was going to see some hands go down. I'm going to be like, ha, I got you. You weren't paying attention. Anyways, so this is a level 300 talk. Because, it, um, because it's expected that you understand what Security Guardians is, I will do a brief overview, just in case you don't know. But today, we're going to be talking about how to fail at building the Security uh, Champions program. My name is Anna. I'm a security solutions architect at AWS. And I think in for a really fun session today, I tried to take some of the foundational concepts of the Security Guardians program, flip it on its head, um, and show you some of the common pitfalls that you should know how to avoid before you start building. And I, um, I hope you enjoy the dumb jokes I make. And if you don't, please laugh anyways, because I need that for myself. Thank you. All right. Clicker, please. OK, so I was trying to trick you with this, but you all beat me. So I mentioned that I'm a security solutions architect at AWS. But right before this, I joined this role, I was actually an application security engineer for AWS. So I was doing the security reviews for our, some of our AI ML services, recognition, comprehend, Lex, poly, Kendra, and so on. So I was the person who had to hit the approve button that you're approved to launch. So therefore, everyone hated me. But it's fine. Uh, so when, at, during my time at AWS OpSec, I was deeply embedded in how we do things, uh, security things at AWS. And now I'm in this unique position where I can use that and teach our customers. So just yesterday, we witnessed Chris's keynote where the central theme was culture of security. And all of the examples Chris mentioned is based off of how we did things at OpSec. So I relate uh, highly to them. And I was an extreme advocate of the Security Guardians program. When I, was an, when I was an OPSEC engineer. I want to say it was because they were, I'll just put it out there, it was because they took a lot of load off of me, right? So at any given time, I had 40 to 70 security reviews assigned to me as a security engineer. I was responsible for those security reviews. I had to make the right call. But the support I got from the uh, guardians on the builder teams uh, changed the game for us. So, at AWS, we're now starting to push culture of security to our customers because we learned a lot of great lessons by doing so. Um, and we're also seeing more and more customers asking us in general, how are you doing security at AWS? You're so big. You're obviously doing something right. So what, like, what, what is the secret sauce here? And we always say it's the culture of security, right? But we want not to be thinking so abstractly. We don't want to be hand wavy. Like, what is the actual juice? Like, what is the thing that we actually do, right? So over time, the more customers asked us, we realized that we need to start externalizing this more, have more talks like this, more blog posts, and so on. And we're realizing our customers want to learn from us how we do organizational change when it comes to the security, and not just security tooling. OK, so we have culture of security, right? We talked about that all day yesterday. Um, but we want to talk about how do we accomplish this. And one of the things that came up was distributing security ownership. It was one of the things that Chris also mentioned, along with other things that we can be doing to uh, build up our culture of security. But our focus here is on distributing security ownership. So this means that we don't want our security organization to be the only party making the security decisions of the products that are being built. And we also don't want them to own any of the security risk of the, uh, that are introduced by the products that the builder teams are building. Instead, we want the builder teams to own both the decision making and the risk. And the security team is the support system for the business to make the right decisions. All right. so. What we need to do to truly accomplish distributing security ownership is build out a mechanism that allows us to do this. And in our case, we're talking about the Security Champions Program. So internally, we call the Security Champions Program Guardians. And anybody want to take a guess as to why it's Guardians? Yeah, there, literally, there's no reason. We just couldn't come up with anything better. So we call this Security Guardians. 
And your mechanism doesn't have to be something like the Security Champions Program or the Security Guardians Program, right? But it, but it, it does need to be a mechanism, and I'll get into this a little bit more. And this mechanism always has to have the same goal because what we're trying to accomplish with distributing security ownership is we want to build in security into our pipelines early and build in security from into our products from day one. We want to be able to better communicate between our business org, our builder org, and our security org. We want uh, to be able to make security decisions faster. And this is not just before Guardians and after Guardians, we're slower versus faster. We want to get faster and faster over time. We want to accelerate our decision making over time. So it feels like when we're launching our 100th feature of uh, some product, we really don't have much work to do from the security perspective. And of course, we always have that ultimate goal of lowering security risk and lowering the impact that we have on, on our business and its customers. All right. So at a high level, so these are for the folks that kept their hand up when they weren't supposed to. Uh, this is what the Security uh, Champions program looks like. Very high level. Uh, security Champions, is all this is, is the builder teams have security champions built into their teams. And these champions are other builders. And the only difference between a guardian and a builder is that a guardian it has some, they're security minded. Uh, they're going out of their way to advocate for security. They're going out of their way to train in security. And how we do things at AWS is we actually empower the guardian to make some security decisions that otherwise the security engineer would make. Um, they're also responsible for things like threat modeling. They lead that effort. They make sure it's up to par before a security review starts and so on. And again, I'm not going to go into too much of the what and the why of the Security Guardians program because you all know what it is. But this is how we distribute security ownership. This is the mechanism we use, right? So what we need to understand that in the Security Guardians program, it's a mechanism because there's always an input and an output, and it's always growing and improving over time. And I'll get into this a little bit more in just a second. But as a reminder, because we're distributing security ownership, the day-to-day -day activity of the security decisions and efforts that need to be make, uh, made actually lie with the guardian and the security engineer just comes in almost as a support and gets to have the power of hitting that approve button, right? So I'm not going to dive too much deeper, but I do have uh, the blog post I co-authored with a fellow SA who is also a Guardian enthusiast, um, as am I. And if you're more of a visual learner, there's a video for you as well. And I promise you we are actively working on improving our resources, right? Again. We're all at this place. We've been talking about Guardians for a couple of years now at AWS, but how do we actually do the thing, right? How do we actually do it? That's what these resources are for, and I promise you there are more coming soon. But you know, we can't give an exact date, so. All right. So how to fail, right? This is, this is why we're here. This is the fun part. Um, how to fail at building your security champions program. Okay. So I told you I took the foundational concepts and I kind of tried to turn them on their head. And I hope every time a new s a slide comes up, you're like, what the heck are you talking about? This sounds so wrong, right? So you ask your builders and your security teams to do the right thing. Right? What, like, what, what do you mean? Do, do you want them to do the wrong thing? No. So what I'm actually saying here is we don't want to ask them to do the right thing because it's not going to be enough. And that's why I've been kind of hounding on the mechanism aspect. So Jeff famously said, um, back in the 2008 all hands, that when, when you are asking for good intentions, you are not asking for a change because people already had good intentions. And in our contest, this makes a lot of sense, right? There's no single builder in this room today or in this entire conference that is going to say, I don't care about security and I don't want to do the right thing. But at the end of the day, they are human and they are going to take the path of least resistance. That, that's, that's especially true when there is a um, hard deadline coming up for a feature launch that's quickly approaching or just looming over your head. You might start making decisions that are not security minded. And again, that's because we're hoping that people take best uh, intentions, um, and, but they are human and they will take the path of least resistance. And this is also true for our security, our, our security experts, right? Even though they're more security minded, doesn't mean that they're not human. So this is why we need to go out of our way to build a mechanism for what we're going to accomplish. Um, and, and that mechanism is the champions program. So 
internally at AWS, we say a mechanism has a very distinct definition. It has to have defined inputs. It has to have defined outputs. And between those two things, we have this endless cycle of adoption, inspection, and tools that help it improve and grow over time. All right, next. You are working backwards from the security problem. This is another way to fail. Anybody want to take a guess at what I think this should actually say? Any guesses? No guesses? Sorry? Uh, correct. So what, what she said was, we should be building security from the beginning. That is true. So what I'm actually trying to say is, we should be working backwards from the business problem. Right? So that was absolutely correct. But in this case, what I'm trying to say is, if we're working backwards from our security problem, our security champions program is likely to fail. Um, if we wanted to scale successfully, we need the business leaders to buy into the program, not just the security leaders. And we want them to take ownership of the program. And this is because the top-down support of the business leaders will be crucial because those are the resources we're stealing from, right? Me as the AppSec engineer, I was like, oh my gosh, Guardian, you're helping me so much, right? But the Guardian is coming from the business side, the builder side. And if we can't convince the business leaders to give us their um, guardian hours and their resources and maybe even their money, they're not going to help us scale the guardians program. And this guardians program really does end up benefiting the security teams as well, right? Because less load on us, we get to help you make your decisions faster. And so even as a security person, I can't imagine a business leader saying, I am willing to slow down growth, let alone take up ownership of this thing that's not helping my business. I don't care if it's security, if it's what, unless it's helping me with my business, I'm not going to do it. So the vision and the goals of the champion program have to be driven by the business goals. So a very vague example of what this could look like, right? I want to launch my features or produce features X percent faster and Y number of guardian hours has helped me get there. And therefore, I'm going to continue to invest in that program and therefore keep launching faster. This could also be related to customer trust, which is sometimes hard to quantify. I guess there's surveys out there where I can say, I want to increase customer, uh, customer trust for my business. And I'm going to do that by increasing my security. And my security is supported by my Guardians program. So we always want to start with the business, with the business problem. And I'm assuming there's a lot of security leaders in there. And uh, I've had a customer engagement where we built out the vision of the security, um, uh, the security guardians program. We created a deck, and we this was the CISO of this organization. That CISO pitched that deck to their business leaders and got buy-in. Right. So there's a very specific way we can say uh, develop our vision, and and the kicker here is that we're working backwards from the business the business problem. Next, we go too fast. Uh, this, this one is weird, right? We're saying that the guardians help us move faster, but you're saying don't go too fast. What, what am I really trying to say here is that I think we should bi think big, but start small. I'm quoting myself. There's like some quoteception going on because I'm quoting myself as I'm quoting myself. Okay, so I've seen organizations feel a bit overwhelmed or get into a bit of an analysis paralysis because guardians as a whole, if you're a big organization making a big change, it can feel a little overwhelming to do it at such a large scale. And they may not have all the data to convince their business leaders, right? Uh, how do we do this big push, but we don't have the data to back it? How do we convince our business leaders? So I think the thing that will set up organizations to fail is if they try to deploy guardians across all their teams everywhere. Instead, what we should be doing is pilot the program, learn from that pilot, and then scale upwards from there. And then how do you actually pick your pilot teams, right? So this is net new content. Um, I'm very excited to share it. So this is an idea of how I think you can pick your pilot teams. And I'm sharing this now, maybe so you can walk away today and take us next few days to think about what these teams look like for you, start brainstorming, and then on Monday, you go talk to those teams, right? So from left to right, uh, we're going to start with the easy win team. 
So to me, the easy win team is that they naturally have this mini guardian program already happening within the team. They have a builder that you recognize as a good security advocate. Maybe they're already good at keeping their security tickets and their findings lower. And inherently, maybe the product is just a lower security risk. So why I included this team was because now what we're able to do is pick a team, iterate it on it, iterate on it quickly, learn quickly, and then iron out those early kinks that you might as well not even try to you know, go into when you expand um, the, org the, the program. And so what also happens when you pick the easy win, win team is that you have a guardian uh, built in that's going to advocate for the program as a whole. Right? That guardian is what's going to help you build that program. You ideally put them in somewhat of a leadership position. Say, hey, help me manage this program. Help me build it out. You're already good at it. Let's build it together. And that's why we pick an easy win team so we can iterate fast, learn quickly. Um, and why not pick from the low hanging fruit? I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Next, we take the high impact team. And so with high impact is what I mean is that this is a team that could benefit from the Guardians program the most. Maybe they're moving really slow, uh, they don't make security de decisions quickly, or they don't have the resources to, to do so. So by implementing the Guardians program with them and challenging them to pick up these practices, you'll be bene they'll be benefiting from it immediately. And again, the, they'll be the team you learn from the most. And finally, even though it's the most effort, it could be worth looking into, if you're into it, is the high risk team. So this is the team where there's already a lot of security risk. Not that they're not mitigating it, but because of the way the product is, maybe you know, it's externally facing, there's a lot of customers on it, and inherently it has high security risk. So what we can do is establish the security program there, the Guardians program there, and help them raise the security bar and so now what you're doing is at all these levels, you're learning the benefits, or from all these terms, you're learning the various benefits Guardians program can give you. You see where the KPIs and the metrics are actually worth leaning into, and then you, you, you develop your program based off of those learnings. So you're getting a bit of a variety, and I show this level of effort graph, so you can kind of pick based off of how big your organization is and how many resources you have or how much buy-in you have. You can pick from one of these teams or all of them or none of them, right? So I came up with this because, because customers were coming to me. They said, hey, you keep talking about Guardian. You keep saying pilot it. But then like, what do I actually do? What teams do I pick? Give me some guidance. So this is what I came up with. That organization I was talking about loved it. You don't have to love it, right? If this gives you an idea of like, hey, I don't like this concept, but I'm going to pick a different team because now I, need, I know what things I could be thinking about, go for it. I won't be hurt at all. I'm not crying on the inside. It's fine. All right. So we do have a blog post, hopefully coming up soon again, that dives deeper into this, that um, will have the words that I said out loud actually explained, but I do think this is being recorded. So you can always come back to it. And then finally, you increase headcount. And now I know you're hating on me right now because I know headcount is rough. And you're saying, why are you even saying something like this? We're begging for headcount. So what I mean here is that instead of converting your existing builders into guardians, you're going externally and hiring them. So a reminder, I'm saying how this is how you fail, right? And I know this one sounds weird and seems obvious that you wouldn't do this, but I've actually seen open roles on LinkedIn for a security champion role by some organizations. I won't name names, mostly because I don't remember them. But anyways, that's what that inspired this slide, right? We don't want to be increasing our headcount just to uh, um, implement a security champions program. Instead, we are converting our builders. If you're going to hire externally, you might as well take an existing security engineer, put them in your um, product team, and get them to learn the system. Right? This doesn't work because the whole point of a guardian is that they know the system well already. They know why it was built. They have all the context that they need to make security decisions faster. Think of them as the bridge between the builder and the security team. Like hiring externally is not going to be worth your time. All right, And if you are ever drifting the wrong way, right, going towards failure, try to take a step back and remind yourself the guardian's program is embedded in the, the guardians are embedded into the builders. We're doing those, where the goal are those four things that we mentioned before about moving faster, communicating better, and so on. And whatever mechanism you pick should be headed that way. So if, 
if you do any of the things that I mentioned, you're headed the wrong direction. Um, and just look back at this chart and you'll kind of remind yourself why we're doing things the way we are. All right, and I think I am out of time. Thank you for laughing at my jokes. I got a few. <laughs>